speed and danger, two qualities at the core of NASCAR's appeal. They pump adrenaline through everyone from the diehard fan to the newcomer. From Daytona International Speedway, I'm Jerry Punch, your host for ESPN Ultimate NASCAR Speed and Danger. The essential lure of living on the edge helps explain why otherwise ordinary people climb inside a stock car and risk their lives. It's as old as earth, wind, and fire. You're going to get strapped inside a machine that someone else has built. It's not like lacing up a pair of cleats. You're getting strapped into a 3,000 pound car and the car becomes the extension of you. It's an ever-changing thing, man, car, track. That's really what is at the core of the sport, who can handle that. At the line, Walter and he wins it. It's just something about speed that, at least some people, that it turns them on. It's bred into us. It's thirst for speed. It's fight, sing, dance, drink, uh, race. Kevin Herbert wins the Daytona 500. It's loud, it's colorful, it's sexy, it's risky. It's an adrenaline rush. It's pushing what your safety factor is that's fun to do. Everybody has something that gets their adrenaline going, an adrenaline junkie or whatever. Race car drivers um, just like speed and living on the edge a little bit. We got trouble. Uh -oh. Oh, There's no different than people jumping out of the airplane. I mean, I won't jump out of an airplane. There's no way, they're crazy. You watch it and you're kind of in awe of it. You're like, wow, what would that be like to go 200 miles an hour? Coolest thing you can ever do without getting a speeding ticket or getting arrested for doing something wrong. The only time you notice you're running fast is if you wreck. That's when it gets really bad. That's when things start happening really fast. In the car in trouble, Bobby Labonte. We all have a sense of danger in us. You know, we all will push the limit. And it's kind of a neat thing to watch them risk death every race day. To go out there and try and win a race. It's a sickness fixed in the bloodstream. The sickness of speed. An obsession born bare from the gut, fueled with fear. Every man a gambler, unabashed, wanting for more, to go faster. We've always been that way. I think back in the caveman days, they were trying to figure out how to get that stone to roll faster. There's something inside us that uh, just wants to feel the rush and the freedom of going fast. Americans are a very free people, free-spirited people, and, and pretty much get to do what you want, and I think speed is a big part of that. You know, a lot of people don't like speed limits on the highway. I think everybody, once they get the chance to get behind the wheel of a car, whether it's a street car or, or a race car, they want to go fast. They want to push the limits. There's that connection in the grandstand that thinks, if I could just get in that car, I could get out there and show them too. And I don't think any other sport has that. If you're at an NBA game, you take one look at Shaq and go like, there's no way. Seemingly ordinary, the racing man is cut simple with the pioneer heart of a cowboy. His is an occupation turned art form, a dance, both aggression and finesse. There's really nothing like being inside a car at speed to understand what great athletes these drivers are. The ones that separate themselves are the ones that know when to be aggressive, when to be patient, you know, really use their head and think about everything that's going on in the race. With 42 other cars, they have to avoid, pass, bump, draft. Drafting is when there's two or more cars and the air off of the first car, the car that in front creates a bubble around that car so that the car that's behind him, it's easier for them to go faster. Newman in the third spot, drafting help appears on the horizon. Conditions constantly change throughout a race, and you have to stay on top of those conditions, move around your line as a driver on the track. You get certain feelings in the car, you feel certain ways, and by explaining it to your team director on what you need to go faster, that's where you get your speed, that's where you win your races. 
Stacey Kane sweeps at Charlotte. There's so much competition that, you know, the age-old question in the garage area is, how do I get my car faster than this guy's car? The cars are endless as far as the things you can change. It's about the four tires hitting the racetrack and how you get each four to work together. And sometimes if you find something that'll help you do your job easier, then it translates into success on the track. Locked into the chase for the next Hell Cup, Kurt Busch wins at Richmond. You're dealing with a machine here. You can't give a race driver steroids. That's not going to help him. But uh, you, you, you can give the race car steroids. <laughs> The root of all this, the grease and gears, the hard work and horsepower, is speed. Distance over time. But the chase is not innocent of risk, and the fall can be swift. Fireball Roberts, in my opinion, was the first superstar in NASCAR. He was a class guy, a tremendous race driver, he was going to only race in three more races. His career was about done. And at Charlotte, he crashed and burned and died. Our cars landed about 30 feet apart on the racetrack. His was upside down. Mine remained upright throughout the uh, accident. And both cars were burning. He was trying to come out of the car when I got to him. I just grabbed him around the shoulders and, and pulled him out. But unfortunately, the damage had already been done. He didn't live that much longer, but he got third degree burns and that was it. That, that made me thought all my life to what he had been through and he was an awful good friend of mine. In 1964, when Fireball Roberts ended up passing away, that was every bit as big news for the racing world back then as Earnhardt's passing later would be. Stock car racing is more than asphalt and pit stops. It started on a beach. Motorists pushing the limits of land speed willing to defy caution and consequence. Daytona Beach, the birthplace of speed. And the king of this sandy straightaway, Sir Malcolm Campbell, a British chap who called his car Bluebird. He set five land speed world records at Daytona the last in 1935 at 276 miles per hour. You can go see it, where the Bluebird, you know, set its records. A wonderfully historical spot. And that's actually the spot where the latter day beach road races were. December 7th, 1941. A date which will live in infamy. During the war, it was very difficult to get an automobile. Victory had come. Old glory waved over a happy land. We won the war, and now, once again, they're making cars. So make a day today to be the USA. And those cars came to represent something very important in America. For the vast majority of this country, a car represents freedom because it allows you to go and do and be where you want to be, what you want to be, and who you want to be, when you want to be it. There's a love affair with automobiles, and I think that's one of the things that really has made NASCAR what it is. The car in America has always been symbolic of getting away, of getting away from your humdrum life, and there may be, you know, some speed and taking a risk. 
when you go back and trace the beginnings of it, these were guys that were over in Europe or in the Pacific Theater, and they'd already been involved with death. They needed to know that while maybe it wasn't a bullet whizzing by their head, they needed that thrill. One man would provide that thrill. Enter Bill France, the father of NASCAR, founded 1948. After running the beach races at Daytona for 20 years, France opened the Daytona International Speedway in 1959. This racetrack breaks up engines and chassis. It's all out, all the way. And so in 1959, they held the first Daytona 500 on Bill France's new track. He saw that he could do something that had never been done before. He saw an opportunity to make money and to help the sport grow. And also, let's face it, they got sick of racing on the beach where they had to worry about what the tide was gonna do and, you know, cars washing into the ocean. And I'm sure he looked at that shoreline that they had run along and thought, you know, man, we could have some bleachers behind there and be selling more tickets. When they built the Daytona International Speedway, they knew they were building the fastest racetrack in the world. Daytona was the first super speedway. Up until then, drivers had never seen anything like that. You had Darlington. It had banking a little bit, but Daytona was just this wall of asphalt. It was all about speed. I enjoyed it with my own car at 130, and that was in 59 which was at that time was a good speed. How fast can a stock car run? Now they know. It certainly intimidated a lot of drivers in the beginning. A lot of these guys came from these short tracks around the southeast, dirt tracks, and then you pull into Daytona, two and a half miles long. First time I went to Daytona, they said, hold it wide open. I've never been on a track where you hold a car wide open. Banking four stories high. People thought, gosh, a car can't even get up on that banking. It'll slide off. It was all about trying to go as fast as you could go. There was no limitation when you went to Daytona. A tri-oval built for speed. Stock cars launched around the racetrack in and out of steep slingshot turns. But the place is more than miles per hour. The biggest thing that makes Daytona a little more special, it's the home of NASCAR. It's called the birthplace of speed. It's all about the history of the place, the people who have come before, the people who have laid the foundation of what our sport is today. It all started and it all ends at Daytona. Dale Earnhardt is a champion of the Daytona 500. The racing that went on there, the battles that happened, it's like, an, I guess, maybe like an old battlefield, Gettysburg, something like that. Front, they both spin, they're in the wall. Petty is sliding. He's coming down toward the finish line. Will he make it? When you talk golf, you think the Masters. When you think horse racing, you think the Kentucky Derby. I mean, it's, it's that kind of setting. There's electricity in the air. And to start the 50th anniversary season of NASCAR, the 40th Daytona 500 is underway. The Daytona 500 is the Super Bowl of stock car racing. It's the biggest TV rating. It has the biggest audience. It kicks off the season. Our sport's a little backwards because we run the biggest race of the year at the beginning, but that's the race that everybody wants to win. That one race makes a statement for the whole season. How'd you do? I won Daytona. That's all you need to say. The one to Daytona 500! One driver knows about winning the Daytona 500 more than any other. The king, Richard Petty. Here they come. Waltrip trying to slingshot. Petty is out in front at the line. Waltrip. Petty wins it. A seven-time champ. Petty learned the stock car trade from his father, Lee Petty winner of the first Daytona 500. In the Petty family, racing runs four generations deep. Welcome back to Daytona International Speed of the green flag to restart this race of lap 96. Adam Petty up 
to sixth place in his first Daytona start. Adam was like most kids until he was about 15 or 16 years old. He was a terror. Then one day he come in and said, I know what I want to do. I want to be a race car driver. And he spent every waking minute on that's what he wanted to do. It goes against nature's order that a son die before his father. The Petty Racing family is coming to terms with that tonight after the death of 19-year-old Bush Series driver Adam Petty. At high speeds, disaster holds no bounds. Adam Petty was killed during practice, not a race. When he did get killed in a race car, that was exactly the way he would want to go. If, he, if he'd ever ask him, how do you want to leave this, this world? I want to do it in a race car. Everything that you're taught about the order of life, when you lose a child, it takes that order of life and turns it upside down uh, because that's not the way it's supposed to be. And the sport has been so good to our family, from my grandfather to myself, my father to Adam even, that even after his accident, you looked at it and you said, you know, we've just been blessed for so many years. And I think we looked at Adam as a blessing uh, to be able to have had him for 19 years uh, that you couldn't be bitter with the sport took his life, but uh, that's the way the good Lord seemed fit to, to do it. For any driver, whether legendary or ordinary, danger lies around every banked turn. Daytona paved the way for bigger, faster racetracks with bigger risks. You are traveling in a NASCAR Grand National stock car, looking at the world's fastest speedway as the drivers see it. Talladega was built in 1969, and it was built at a time when America was making bold steps. The first man on the moon. It's still kind of a Wild West mentality. I mean, Talladega was built as the first track where a stock car could run 200 miles an hour. Racing is a game of speed, and I guess that's really the reason I like to run a place like Talladega. In 1969, NASCAR ran its first race at Talladega Super Speedway in Alabama. But the fastest track on tour didn't open without controversy. I know we couldn't race at that speed and be safe, and everybody else did too. You know, it, it was just something that couldn't be fixed that day. So they all struck at that very first race at Talladega. It was a memorable day because it was the first time that drivers had ever really jointly walked out of the park. But their concern was really safety. It wasn't money or, or objections to management. They were concerned about their behind. The drivers were afraid the tires would not hold up at those speeds on five story high banking there. You run four or five laps, tires is coming apart. A good year in Firestone was just not ready for that kind of speed. NASCAR's top guns walked out, but Bill France ran the race anyway, and Richard Brickhouse took the only checkered flag of his career. Today, Talladega is a major stop on the NASCAR circuit. But debate over the value and safety of super speedways still lingers. There are some people that love super speedways. There are some people that don't like super speedways. When they started to be built about 1960, it brought a whole new element to racing. Racing's always been about speed, but we went from racing at speeds of 110 to 115 miles an hour to at that time 150, 160. Now, you know, Talladega, we got up over 200. Super speedways are here to stay. As much as we like to sometimes think that they're going to bulldoze it down and make it a smaller track and take the banking out, it's not really going to happen. Whether you enjoy them or not, you're going to be doing it. I mean, it's nail biting for us. Bad crash here at Talladega. High speed at Talladega and so many wrecks at Talladega that they've never saw that speedway. 
to keep the big wreck from happening. At Talladega, it's called the big one. Expect it every race. The reality, wrecks are part of racing. Catastrophe commonly accepted as the cost of speed. You go to Talladega and Daytona and you see these wild flips down the back stretch. Oh, trouble! Ricky Rudd slamming toward the wall! It's horrifying. Your heart stops. It's just amazing that they get out of them, but they do. Not a scrap. One type of accident to this day will take your breath away, and that's whenever a car gets airborne. Over once and a half and on his roof. A scary, scary crash for Elliot Sadler. It's dangerous. I mean, obviously, anytime you mix man and machine together, there's danger. A 190 mile per hour crash tears apart six automobiles in the back stretch. Unlike any other sport, in NASCAR, a mistake can get you killed. We got trouble. This is going to hurt. The only sport that may be as dangerous, and I don't think it's a sport disarming bombs. Serious crash. Daryl Walter is the driver of the I think it's obvious what the dangers are, which is part of the appeal of it. I mean, let's face it. I mean, it's some people go to races to watch the wreck. Big time trouble. We're an entertainment business, and, uh, you know, wrecks are part of it. But what they want to do is they want to see their hero emerge with his hands thrust upward and say, the Grim Reaper didn't get me today. There you see Ryan Newman right there. Oh, yeah, he waved to the crowd. All right, buddy. The psychology of the stock car driver, a modern American knight clad in a fireproof suit, a daredevil heart, willing to bet himself in a game of oval track roulette. The average is five and a half wrecks per race. Drivers exist in spite of fear. Nobody feels invincible, but I think every driver here has accepted the fact that this is a dangerous sport and at any time, anything can happen. I don't think I got no more bravery than anybody else. I just think I was educated not to be afraid of it. Pretty damaging there for Stremmy. I'm out there to win races and beat the 42 other guys and do my best. I'm not out there worried about if I'm a wreck or not. There we go. Oh, man. Once that seed of doubt gets planted in a driver's head, that he's worried about the speed, he's worried about being hurt, then that's probably the beginning and the end of his racing career. I also don't think they're just totally stupid and have no emotions or, or no concern. I think they have apprehensions. I don't think I ever crawled in a race car that I didn't say a little prayer. You have to have a little bit of fear, but you have to have the confidence as well to know that you've done it time after time. Kurt Busch, 14th victory in his next Tell Cup career. I get scared in a race car all the time. It's just uh, scared of different things. Fear of failure, fear of skinning up your car once in a while in the right situation fear of getting hurt or, you know, being mortal, you know? I mean, uh, that's rare. 30. That's the number of racing-related deaths in NASCAR since 1954. Few compared to the countless crashes that occur year after year wrecks that wrench stomachs and scream for mercy, yet somehow the drivers almost always walk away. Magicians, turning some of the greatest escapes ever seen. Daytona, 1961, Johnny Beauchamp and Lee Petty. I went down and I saw Lee Petty all twisted up in the car, and it just shook me up. I mean, it absolutely shook me up. Pocono, 1992. Davy Allison. I'm sitting there watching that, and I'm thinking, there is no way in the world that this guy can possibly survive. He ended up driving in the next race. It was, it was incredible, just incredible. OK, a terrible crash. Richard Petty. Daytona, 1988, Richard Petty. In my mind, immediately, I thought, you know, there's no way he's alive. It was like, of course he's dead. And then he gets out of the car. 
He might have a broke ankle. I don't know. But other than that, he's okay. Talladega, 1993. Rusty Wallace. It just seemed like it would never stop. When it finally did stop, there was that moment where all of a sudden, you don't know, is he alive? Is he dead? What, what has happened? And you see the steam coming up off the car. And then you see the movement. Yeah, he's moving. I see him moving around in the car. And you realize that he dodged the bullet, that he's alive. Bristol, 1990. Michael Waltrip. I think I'm all right. Uh, got some contusions and a little bit of confusion, but uh, that's probably not too unusual. Can't really tell you what happened. It was amazing. I mean, it was the most unbelievable thing you'd ever seen because the car just, on impact, just went away. Darrell, what an unbelievable crash that your little brother Michael had. Let's praise God, Benny's alive. I, I was standing looking right at it, and, and I couldn't move. I mean, I just froze. I, I never seen anything like that in my life. Yet Michael was sitting there fine. He was, he was OK. It was really incredible. We were standing ovation here in the crowd. They had all of our seats. You no longer worry so much about these guys that are flipping and landing on their roofs. The scary ones now are the hard hits into the wall. Charlotte, 2006, Mark Martin. Mark Martin's freakish way, the guy jumps out of his car and stands on top of it and raises his arms to the crowd. And you're like, dude, that was kind of a hard hit you just had. And you know, he, he comes out after he gets checked out in the care center and he says, I wasn't ready to meet my maker tonight. That's just the mentality that these guys have. They get in these crazy wrecks that destroy their cars, and they're like, wow, that was cool. Daytona 500, 2001. In this race, the world of NASCAR was not so lucky. Tony Stewart goes for one of the wildest rides in recent memory at Daytona. I remember the car coming to a stop, and I remember my teammate putting the window net down, and I looked at, looked at him like, what are you doing here? And I asked him what he was doing. He goes, well, you landed on my car. It was pretty incredible to see what happened, but obviously what happened later in the day was much more substantial than what we had happen. The driver knows this game is more than sport. It's a harsh reality no one escapes, not even those heroes born seemingly immortal. Tony Stewart going airborne here. Boy, Nick gets hit by every car in the field, seems like, and Tony Stewart's car just took a whale of a ride. When you have a wreck, as we saw before, sometimes you can't get out of your own way. Come on, we do. And one of the biggest reasons right now that we at least feel good about what has happened on the back straightaway is because of the safety of these cars. Larry? With about 11 or 12 seconds left in the 2001 Daytona 500, the Elvis Presley of NASCAR was killed, a man that we all thought was totally invincible. This is undoubtedly one of the toughest announcements that I've ever personally had to make. Uh, we've lost Dale Earnhardt. It was an innocuous wreck. We've seen thousands of them, a lot worse than that, the driver didn't get hurt at all. When it was announced that he had been killed, it was just, how could he be killed in a wreck like that? I've been an Earnhardt fan for several years, and I just never thought I'd be there when he passed away. <laughs> the wrecks that kill drivers are the ones where you say, that didn't look so bad. The wrecks where they're spinning, flipping, barrel rolling down the front or back stretch. You say there's no way a man can live through that. They almost always do. Drivers began to feel more mortal after Dale Earnhardt died. And this guy was Superman. And there was no kryptonite out there that was going to take Dale Earnhardt down. Dale was reality. It was, man, it's in your face, and you can't ignore it. 
This can happen to anybody. No man can outrun death. A proposition the stock car driver has stared square in the eye since his earliest laps. From 1954 to 1965, there were 13 fatal wrecks. When it first started, this was a sport where you could see three of your best friends be buried within the next six months. Went a lot of safety. Back in the period of 64 to 69, that was the bloodiest period in the history of American motorsports. And stock cars just got going faster than the safety allowed them. I've never known a NASCAR driver, but certainly not the classic era of NASCAR drivers. They were all very, very fatalistic. I feel like if it's my time, uh, it's going to happen, you know, but. Uh, uh, if that's the way the good Lord wants to take you, it's going to be it. Our schedule doesn't allow us to grieve. Our schedule doesn't allow us to linger on the bad. It doesn't even allow us to celebrate the good very long. If someone died at the track yesterday, they get in the car, they, they got a job to do, it's what they do. You got to go on. The world still turns, you know, and, and racing going to go on. To some, it's fate. For others, arbitrary and senseless. But tragedy on a racetrack is not made easy through some kind of understanding. It's the lesson learned that ensures a fallen driver is not lost in vain. It's unfortunate that someone passing away, it takes that to advance safety, but it's, it's always been the case, you know, from Fireball Roberts' death all the way until Dale Earnhardt's death or even an automobile crashes, period, you progress safety. Most of the safety equipment advances have come since the death of Dale Earnhardt. Dale Earnhardt died from a basilar skull fracture, the same injury that killed Adam Petty just nine months prior. NASCAR took note. The Hans device, designed to limit violent neck movement, is now mandatory for all drivers. The restraining walls that encompass racetracks have been softened as well. Safer barriers mean that these drivers are scrubbing off a lot of the impact when they hit the wall. The spike of G-force when a driver hits the wall is, is almost in half of where it used to be. The miracle, Mike Harmon climbed out of that car uninjured. Without the Hans device and the safer wall, who knows what happens. The loss of a legend can have an indelible impact. When NASCAR's first superstar, Glenn Fireball Roberts, died from a fiery crash in 1964, NASCAR made its first real safety innovations. Because that huge name getting killed by fire, what came about the next year was fire retardant uniforms and also fuel cells that we take so much for granted today rarely will explode on impact. The Winston 500 is underway. Death behind the wheel is a grim awakening. But fatality isn't a requirement of progress. See the Winston 500, 1987. The pace is 209.82 oh. miles an hour. For that race, for the pole, Bill Elliott set the ultimate NASCAR speed qualifying record of 212 miles an hour. Oh, we have a problem. Bobby Allison with a horrible crash here on the front stretch. It has torn out a complete section of protective railing. You knew it was a bad wreck, but you stood there gaping at this hole in the fence. The race was red flagged. I ran down and I was asking, was he all right? He said, yes. He said, but Donnie, he says, you can't believe the ride I took. And he was really, honestly and truthfully at that time, still shaking about that. And then you looked up and you saw these two thin cables that didn't break. You thought, thank God, that's all that separated us from something so tragic that 
you know, our sport may never have recovered from. He didn't get up to the fencing, but not into the stand. That's the day when NASCAR really realized he can't let these cars go that fast. The sport couldn't stand to have a car flying up and getting in the grandstands or getting somebody hurt. So their kind of fix to it was restrictor plates. Allison's wreck at Talladega made the case. Too fast is too dangerous. Restrictor plates designed to limit a car's power were put in place at Talladega and Daytona the following season. But lower velocity hasn't led to fewer wrecks. I'm not a big fan of restrictor plates. It's not fun as a driver when you have a really good car, but they slow you down. And they slow everybody down, but it's just being restricted that's not as much fun. Drivers will tell you, sometimes they think it's a lot more dangerous for them to be driving in restrictor plate races. If they let them take the plates off, the packs of cars would break up to a degree where if somebody did lose control, he's not taking 15 other cars out with him. There's going to be 10 or more cars involved. But you really feel like it's a necessary evil. Everybody always wondered what would happen if there were no restricted plates. Rusty Wallace went to Talladega in 2005 and turned an average lap of 233 miles an hour. That's a little bit fast. And, it, and if a car got sideways at that point, it probably would fly into the grandstands, and we certainly don't want anything like that. So it's what we have to do right now, unless somebody comes up with a greater idea, to slow the cars down at those two race points. The quest for speed seems a wide open affair, but there is a line where freedom gives way to disaster. And there are the remains of the car that went over the wall. Fear can destroy a racer's will. A small sense of security goes a long way at high speeds. I feel real safe. I don't even think about dying or anything when I'm inside the car. I mean, I. I go out there and give it all I got. I don't even worry about crashing. I mean, if I crash, I feel like I'm gonna be able to get out and get right in my other car. You definitely get confident in your equipment and your surroundings, but you know, that can bite you any second. You gotta respect, you know, the job you do and what we do out there. Clint Boyer. Whammo. Over the last several years, they've gone that extra bit to get the cars even safer. And I, I think that we have some of the safest race cars that I've ever been behind the wheel of right now. You know, our car of tomorrow is towards safety, geared towards safety, and the car drivers to the right more. We're moving the driver away from the impact zone on the driver's side. We're in an era where the drivers are as safe as they've ever been, and we can only hope that means we don't have to deal with putting any more of them in the ground. To me, it's all about trying to be faster than the competition and outdo everyone else and ultimately see the checkered flag. Jeff Gordon will win his third Coca-Cola 600. The cars that we got right now are awfully fast, and your top drivers and car owners want to keep it that way. They don't want any more parity than already exists because when they get up in the morning, they want to make their car go fast. Biffle wins the Dodge Charger 500. And sometimes going faster is not always better. The sport appears to be all about speed, but there's a catch. The bottom line isn't just pure acceleration. It's the chase for the checkered flag that really counts. We keep getting faster and faster, which is a ton of fun, you know, but to make racing exciting, it doesn't need to be, you know, faster. While the drivers might want the rush and the thrill of going 230 miles per hour, probably wouldn't be that great a show for the fans. I love going fast, but faster doesn't make for better races, and better races make for exciting races, and exciting races make for more fans, I hope. The races would be more exciting and better races if some of these racetracks we were running slower. I think you would see more passes, you would see more side-by-side -side racing. 
closer together to run, the more rivalries you have, and uh, the more fans like it. Kenseth wins the Auto Club 500. Most people associate racing with speed. Uh, but a great race is when it comes down and the competition is two wide or three wide at the end of the race. Richard Petty was just in front as they came across the line. Speed's irrelevant to racing, okay? Uh, you know, if all the cars are running 150 mile an hour or all the cars are running 200 mile an hour, who cares? You know, the competition is what it's all about. I'm all for the competition because I'm in the ticket selling business. I want to sell as many tickets as we can and I want to have the highest rating. And, and that, that's the crux of the business. If we don't have those two things, we don't last. NASCAR is the fastest growing spectator sport in America. It's a potent formula, equal parts speed, competition, and danger. But there's one final piece, those brave souls behind the wheel, willing to take the risk compelled to finish first. What's in the heart? What drives a guy? The ones that really make it to the top have something inside that, that just drives them like fire. Basic attributes that made a great race driver back then still apply. If there were no prize money, a guy like Tony Stewart would still race. A guy like Ken Schrader would still race. David Pearson, Petty, Allison, Hale, Yarborough, all of the great would have raced regardless. What we do today is exactly the same thing that my grandfather did you know, 60 some years ago. You start at a white line, you ride around in circles for a set distance, and you end at the same place. You don't take a trip, you don't go anywhere, you don't do anything, you just go in circles for a long period of time. A race, the simplest form of sport, and just a few laps will captivate the masses. Automobile racing, you are inches away from the big kaboom. It isn't so much blood sport as it is sensation, as it is excitement, as it is risk to see somebody being a daredevil. Rusty Wallace, 20 feet in the air, spinning, crashing. It's just something special that, that is, draws you to it, and you can't get away from it. It's like a bad drug, but it's a wonderful drug. It's adrenaline plus. It's just the sound and the, and the smell and the, and the sight of seeing cars go around the racetrack, and that's why NASCAR is such a well-spectated sport, because seeing it live is completely different than out on TV. It's noise. It's loud. It's dangerous. It's daring. It's about who we are. It's our culture. 